And it's a pleasure to have everybody here today uh, for our 2022 season kickoff meeting. Today, we're really going to focus on the results from the past uh, season. We've got a, a lot of great data this year. Kind of excited to roll it out for the first time today. And as a reminder, you know, we wouldn't even have this program if it wasn't for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Great Lakes Mass Marking Program. Uh, they've been stocking steelhead in uh, Lake Michigan and other Great Lakes waters the U.S. since 2018 uh, with an adipose fin clip and a coat of wire tag. Uh, so that's been done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in conjunction with states around the basin. We are missing a stock 2021 year class in Michigan waters due to uh, the, the missing year class from COVID in 2020. And that means this season, this upcoming season, starting with the fish that are entering the rivers now, we will be missing the lake age two stocked fish. So as a reminder, as we go through the graphs from last year, we, are, we were missing the lake age one stocked fish or the skippers from last year. And, and that'll be important as we go through and talk about the results. And another reminder, around 90% of the steelhead that we have in the creel tend to be lake age two or three, with a very few reaching age uh, five or six. So this upcoming year, you know, we're, we're looking closer and closer to kind of a, a true uh, percent stocked when we talk about percent clipped. But I'm still going to say percent clipped because we still have a few of those older fish in the system that may have been stocked before mass marking. Again, a quick uh, reminder on the program itself. Uh, you can register online. Everyone here is already registered. And the idea is to record every river fishing trip that targets steelhead, including skunk trips. That's something that this year people did pretty well on, but I was really a stickler. So if you, if I thought someone had not recorded skunk trips, they didn't get included in the calculations of catch rate. So if you didn't include skunk trips, your fish were still counted as part of the catch. So when we see the length graphs and percent wild, all that data got in there as long as you had complete data on fish. But uh, we were real careful not to use uh, data that didn't include skunk trips in those uh, calculations of catch per unit effort, because obviously if you're not recording skunk trips, then you're going to inflate that value. Uh, it's important to measure every steelhead caught and check for fin clips. And uh, we did phase in this uh, estimated size range uh, reporting over the last year, and it worked pretty well. We had a few hundred fish that came in that were estimated, and you'll see that uh, we can't use those fish, obviously, for things like calculations of average length, but uh, we have some nice uh, inclusion of that as well. Things new this year, we do have new uh, updates available for the apps. Uh, the iOS one is, is up and running for Apple. Android might take a day or two. It's already been uploaded, but it takes them a little while to review it. Uh, we should have a fix for the Android dashboard uh, screen where you could calculate your own uh, trips taken, fish caught, etc. It just wasn't displaying well. It still worked uh, before, but we should have an update that makes it display better, as well as a few new locations that we saw in data coming in from last year. The one that's a little tricky is the White River, the south branch of the White River. Most people actually just refer to as the White River flowing from Hesperia to where the north branch comes in. So that is how it'll appear now. If you fish the White River, it'll say White River Hesperia to North Branch. That'll be the upper river. And White River from the North Branch to the mouth is the lower river, whereas the North Branch is a standalone system. So we'll get into the results now and we'll try to, to chug through these again. I do kind of apologize because it's heavy on, on graphs, but uh, I think it's kind of necessary now because everyone is really going to want to see a lot of the fine detail for their own systems, I think. Uh, first, we'll go through an overview by Great Lake Basin, and then we'll go into overviews by watershed and take a high level look at percent clipped across uh, you know, one river system to the next. Uh, but again, I, if you have questions on any specifics, put it in that Q&A box. We're going to take the chat off for now, because as I go through all the graphs over the next half hour, 45 minutes or so, we will be circling back at the end when we go team by team and take really detailed looks at tributaries within each river system and different segments of the river. So you won't see that at first on the graphs. You won't see like upper Manistee versus middle versus lower, but we'll see that again at the end and we'll turn the chat on again at the end so we can have a lot of crosstalk and discussion. But I do want to get through all the details uh, first because I know I'll, I'll head off some of those questions. 
We'll also talk about factors influencing selective harvest because we got some good information on that yet this year, both from the survey and the, the results that came in. And again, wrap up with team reports. So first good news on participation this year, we had a big uptick um, overall. We had a lot of new people sign up for the program. Uh, we, our, our registrant numbers jumped from just under 200 to almost 500 uh, over the past season. Uh, our survey returns came up a little bit and uh, along with our complete data sets on steelhead, the total number of steelhead uh, really went up to almost 3,000 fish. And in fact, if you look at the total that came in, we were at 3,542 fish or steelhead reported over the past season, but not all of those uh, were from complete data sets. So there were 600 fish from people who either didn't return the survey or didn't consent on the survey to share their information. And then there were others that they did take the survey and they said, I actually didn't wind up recording all my fish and it was kind of haphazard for some reason or another. But I did a lot of follow up by email this year. So you might have gotten some really specific questions from me because there were some instances where we could still use partial data sets. For example, if you recorded all of your data while you were fishing on the Muskegon River, but you didn't record a few trips when you went to some other tributaries up north, that's actually okay because we know your data were complete for that Musk Muskegon River system. So I think that's something I'll do uh, next year again because we really, we bumped up the, the total that we called complete data sets thanks to a lot of follow-up with people this year. So if we look back to our first season, this would be the 2020-2021 season, uh, we looked at angler satisfaction with a variety of questions on the survey. And I have these color coded. Uh, so in the two to three range, you have orange and three to four range, you have yellow. If you look, these are all questions that got at this idea of angler satisfaction. How good was the steelhead fishing uh, overall? And uh, how good was it October, December? Uh, how good was it versus last year versus the last five years? So you see there's a lot of orange here. And I kind of do this to get this high level uh, idea of how people were satisfied over the course of the whole year. And if you look at our past year, so 2021, 2022, you see that a lot of this bumped up over three. So not a huge bump up, but in general, uh, it looks like people were a little more satisfied with steelhead fishing over the past season than they were the season before that. So that's good to see. We did ask a question about fishing pressure because we've had a lot of comments, you know, a lot, a lot of people concerned just that the pressure on the river has really grown over the last few years, especially since uh, people are getting outside more since COVID. And people did say a lot, a lot heavier pressure than normal uh, noted on the rivers again this past season. So maybe it didn't, didn't really tail off after that big uh, bump that we saw from COVID. So the next series of graphs are a little different. Uh, these are funnel plots and you may not have seen these before, but it's a good way to kind of look at two different factors and how they're related. So here, this is survey results and we categorize people. We asked on the survey, do you release all your steelhead? Do you release most of them? Do you keep most of them or do you keep all legal steelhead? And we also asked about people's self-reported uh, level of expertise fishing. So we had those uh, range from intermediate to advanced to professional folks who are, are guides or charter captains. Um, we only had one beginner answer the entire survey actually. So I, I didn't show this, that on this particular uh, chart. So what does this mean here? So we see the funnels that kind of relate the two. And what we see is intermediate to advanced anglers uh, are less likely to be releasing all the steelhead uh, versus the professional anglers. And intermediate and advanced anglers were also a bit more likely, although still not terribly likely to be in this uh, keep most or all category. So this just gives you a, you a good reminder, like when we're interpreting the results, remember who we're surveying. A lot of the anglers who followed through and, and did the data collection and did uh, complete our end of the year survey, tended to be the advanced and professional anglers with a few intermediate anglers as well. And uh, again, those advanced and professional folks are really by and large uh, releasing most or all their steelhead. I did combine these two groups at the bottom, keep most and keep all steelhead, since we only had one respondent who said they kept all legal steelhead they could. So for the next series of graphs, I'm gonna show some other things that are related to this tendency to 
uh, keep or catch and release fish. So I'll just remind you that I'm collapsing those two categories into one. So here up on the top, we have that release all category, the release most, and then the keep most or all category. And we asked specifically about uh, the one fish limit that was approved last year by the NRC and replied to certain waters from uh, March 15th to May 15th uh, with a one fish limit. So we asked, uh, basically we, we had a series of statements. So we said the one fish limit should apply to all waters, should apply to more waters, should apply to fewer waters, should apply to no waters or about right. So what this funnel plot does is relates those uh, categories to a uh, person's tendency to release fish. So folks who are catch and release only were very much in favor of applying that one fish limit to all waters. And it's interesting, as you go to the right here, you see that people who keep most or all fish were not for applying this limit to all waters. But it's also interesting that a lot of them said it was about right, uh, or it should apply maybe to more waters, but not all. So again, sample size is low here for folks who kept most or all. And, and I want to keep that in mind because for this whole series of graphs here and the discussion, we got to remember that we're mostly dealing with uh, really experienced anglers, professional and advanced anglers who tend to catch and release. So the next question was the one fish limit should apply year round to a longer time frame, shorter time frame, no time frame, or just about right. And you see the same trend, right? Uh, the people who tend to catch and release fish were very much in favor of year round, whereas those who keep most of all, none of them fell into that year round category. But again, they were still generally uh, supportive of the, the regulation as it is, or even maybe even a little stricter as, as far as uh, pertaining to a longer time period, but just not the entire year. So we had another question, the harvest limit reduction would help to ensure the long-term viability of steelhead populations in Michigan. And this is something we discussed a lot last year. Uh, and we, we kind of got the, the DNR take on it. If you remember that the harvest limit reduction, biologically, we don't really have good evidence to say that the limit is definitely necessary to ensure long-term viability of, of the steelhead population. So again, this is an opinion poll people who took the poll tend to strongly agree with this. But again, biologically, uh, we have more questions if this is really necessary. But you contrast that to the next one uh, that is basically the harvest limit reduction would help boost catch because released fish can be recycled or caught multiple times within the river system. And again, we got strong agreement from anglers, but I, I think uh, among biologists, you probably see the two flipped where people would, would be more likely to say, uh, you know, from a biological basis that the catch and release and recycling probably makes more of a justification than than the actual need to sustain the species. So a uh, couple more additional questions on management options. Uh, people really tended to agree with the statement, my home water would benefit from additional stocking of steelhead. And you'll see these all came out high. People were really supportive of habitat restoration. They really thought that their home waters would benefit from habitat restoration as well. And they also thought that waters would benefit from reducing the steel eye bag limit. So we kind of had these out there just to compare, you know, what, what people were thinking about, uh, what management actions could be beneficial to their waters and all of them is the short answer. So here's an overview of where steelhead were caught last year. Uh, these are steelhead that were over 15 inches long and included in complete data sets. So folks, we had a pretty good indication that they had data on at least 90% of the steelhead they caught over the course of the entire year. And we only, we had that 15 inch cutoff kind of set beforehand because we know that you might catch rainbow trout, stream resident rainbows or smolts or par that uh, can be difficult to, to figure out if you're dealing with a resident stream trout versus a young steelhead. So for most of these graphs, I'm just having the, the 15 inch plus fish included and called steelhead. So if you look, uh, Lake Michigan, of course, has the, the highest total by far. We saw a huge bump up in Lake Michigan, a uh, lot of river systems there with, with over 100 fish. Uh, we had pretty good participation too from the Clinton and the Huron. Uh, unfortunately, we actually saw participation drop off in the Huron Basin quite a bit this year. Last year, we had a lot of fish from the Asable system. This year, we only had five, so we can't really say much about it. We did have a few in the rifle, uh, but really not much. Uh, Lake Superior 
we we didn't have a lot of fish, but it was a bump up from the year before. So it was nice to see some fish coming in from the Superior Basin. And I'll say that we actually had a lot of people sign up right at the end of the year in Lake Superior too. So I expect that to be higher next year. So going back two years, this is the graph that I, I showed at our kickoff meeting last year. Uh, and you can just get a look at that total number that N is the number of fish per basin last year. So again, we, we actually had a fall off in the Huron, um, but a big increase from Lake Michigan. Uh, one thing you'll notice is there, there was this big pulse of fish between 15 and 20 inches in Lake Michigan that you didn't see as much in the Huron and Erie Basin. And that would be, you know, your skippers, your fish that have only been out one year. So, uh, you know, we don't we don't have the ability to age our fish and we're not doing real uh, estimates of growth either. But it, it could be that people that the, the fish that are growing a little faster in Lake Michigan may have more of a tendency to, to run a little early as age one fish. Um, not entirely sure on that, but it, it kind of makes sense. And you see it in the graphs here. And here is our data from this year. So here's over you know, 2,600 fish in the Lake Michigan Basin streams this year. And, I, you know, as a biologist, we like to see nice graphs like this that have nice, smooth curves. It means we had a really big sample size and we have a really good feeling that this represents the populations out there in our streams because we we have uh, what we would expect, which is these bell-shaped humps in the graphs for both the unclipped fish, which are in the light blue, and the clipped fish, which are in the dark blue. So key in on that because there's a lot more graphs coming that have unclipped fish in light blue and the clipped fish in the darker blue. Now, what you might notice right away is interesting in that uh, 15 to 19 inch range or maybe 14 to 21 inch range there, we have a big pulse of unclipped fish with no clipped fish in that range. And there's a reason for that. That's our missing year class. We did not have stocked fish coming into the system in 2021, but we did have wild fish. So we can pick that out. Even though we can't really age individual fish, we can really see that pulse of fish that represents our uh, lake age one fish last year. And they're all wild. Uh, so remember when we did when we go to the estimates, uh, we asked people last year to estimate different size classes if they didn't have an accurate length on an individual fish. And we chose 15 to 19 inches for that range. We were thinking that would correspond pretty closely to the age one fish. And it is close, but it isn't perfect. You know, looking at this, you could probably include 14 to 21 inches, frankly, but uh, th that was the way it was set beforehand. So you'll see that later. Um, uh, moving on, this is where things don't look as good, right? Lake Huron, um, you have very spotty data. It's hard to make a lot of sense when you have only a few fish in each bar and the bars are spread out. Something interesting here, though, I did include the smaller fish for Huron. We had some people catching smolts that they were pretty sure were, were steelhead, a lot of clipped fish in the Rifle River, and a few wild fish too. So it was neat to get that uh, kind of different perspective from someone who was catching the small fish before they migrated out. Uh, but again, the data here look very different than what we have from Lake Michigan. So it's kind of hard to make big comparisons. Uh, Lake Superior, again, looks very different. Uh, not surprising. We have all wild fish here, all unclipped fish in Lake Superior. And we don't see many bigger fish, uh, nothing over 27 inches. We also don't see a lot of the, the smaller fish, uh, probably, again, because they're, they're not as likely to run as skippers, I would guess. But uh, it's a neat contrast to see here between the Superior and the, the Michigan fish. And hopefully we'll have even more next year specific to individual rivers. St. Clair and Erie, uh, this is this would be the Huron and the Clinton system, which are both very different. So I won't say too much. We'll wait and circle back to those separately because they're pretty different systems. But uh, again, it was nice. We, we did have pretty good participation from both of those this year. So now we'll go and look at fish by length for each major watershed. So these graphs are going to show fish in, a, in an individual river's watershed. This would mean the river that's listed and all the tributaries, including lower, middle, upper sections, everything within the watershed, all the tributaries, everything uh, in one graph. So the Betsy, uh, you can see here the length ranges are on the bottom. And these graphs are going to include 
both the estimated fish and the precisely measured fish because we're using those bins so we can say, well, this fish was estimated into that bin or this fish was actually measured, but it still fits within that range. So these really give us, you know, the total of all the fish that were caught and assessed by anglers. And you look at uh, the y-axis, the number of steelhead caught is going to be different from river to river. So the, uh, the high bars here are almost 200 fish in that 25 to 28 inch range. What you'll see are some commonalities as we go through. Here's the Manistee River. Again, even more fish per bar on the Manistee because we had a huge response there. But the 25 to 28 inch range uh, tends to be uh, more numerous than the others. Uh, you see the, the smaller fish were also pretty prevalent in the Manistee. The Pear Marquette, uh, again, uh, 25 to 28 inches really comes out as uh, the, the highest bar here. And we also see a huge prevalence of unclipped versus clipped fish, not surprising the PM. The Muskegon uh, we have here, then the Grand and Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo starts looking a little different with a, a lot more stocked fish or clipped fish showing up. Uh, but again, that 25 to 28 inch range for all of them uh, tends to come out as the, the most abundant size class. And when you look at the St. Joe, things start to look a little different. Uh, we had a lot of large fish come in on the St. Joe River, and uh, the 29 inch plus uh, size class is actually the most abundant. So something, now that we have all this up in the screen, something that kind of jumped out to me uh, is the 15 to 19 inch range fish. So remember 15 to 19 inch, that's our mostly uh, lake age one fish. And we know that none of those bars should have much of any uh, clipped fish in there and they don't. But when you look uh, from one river to the next, some rivers really didn't have much at all. The St. Joe, the Muskegon, the Kalamazoo really didn't have any skippers uh, to speak of. That means, you know, no wild fish coming up in those younger year classes, maybe, or maybe they just didn't run as skippers. You know, we can't say for sure, but it's something to keep an eye on for next year because you would expect that a river like the Manistee, we had this huge pulse. Like that, that's a lot of small 15 to 19 inch wild fish coming into the Manistee, which uh, probably bodes well for the next year or two. Uh, and then we had several rivers that were kind of intermediate, uh, including the Grand, which might be a surprise to some. The Grand has a pretty good uh, looking, uh, you know, year class of those wild skippers coming in last year and the Betsy as well. So I'll say a quick word about some other marks that showed up. By and large, we're talking all about just adipose fin clips, but there are some fish stocked with combination clips, particularly in Wisconsin. Uh, it was interesting, the only fish with like a Wisconsin specific combination, the adipose and left maxilla, uh, was caught in the Huron River and Lower Peninsula. So not entirely sure that that was a Wisconsin fish. Um, a maxilla mark, that's the upper jawbone. So it's you know, conceivable that a fish could get a wounded, uh, a hook wound or something, and it could look very much like a maxilla clip. Uh, but again, one out of like 3,000 fish, it's it's not many. Uh, interesting that we didn't get more scamania uh, reported. I mean, there are scamania stocked in, in Indiana that just have the adipose fin clip, but in the Manistee, they've been stocked with the adipose and right ventral clip. So we did have one fish caught in the upper manistee that did have the combination of the adipose and right ventral, but you might have expected more. We didn't have a lot of fish caught during the summer months, really only a handful, less than 10. But uh, it's interesting that we didn't see that, that, um, that combination of adipose and right ventral a little more. One thing I want to note is that several people, we had six fish reported with a pectoral fin clip, but they have not been used in recent years on steelhead. Uh, they have on, on some lake trout in years past that may still be around, but they shouldn't be showing up in steelhead. So I got a chance to visit the Little Manistee River weir when they were taking steelhead this year and got uh, this photo of a fish that looks like it probably had a fin clip, but it didn't. We know this was not a clip fish. This was just uh, a damaged fin early in life that regrew oddly. So this can happen. And sometimes, you know, I think people are, are picking up damaged fins and occasionally recording them as clips when they're not. But again, six out of like 3000 fish is not bad. Another thing I wanted to point out, um, and maybe we can chime in later if we have more discussion about, about the Manistee specifically, but it did look like uh, fish were planted without an adipose fin clip 
Uh, and this is specifically the scamania planted at Tippy Dam in 2021. So my guess is these fish were not marked by the autofish trailers with the, the adipose fin clip, but they still received a right ventral fin clip. So something to be out and the lookout for in the manistee is uh, scamanias that may not have an adipose fin clip. So make sure you check that ventral fi fin as well. So uh, again, from here out, when we say fin clip, we're really talking about adipose fin clip steelhead from last year. And uh, if you look uh, from all, across all the major river systems, we kind of have a few different uh, patterns that jump out. We have a lot of river systems, uh, the Betsy, the Grand, the Manistee, the Muskegon, the White. They're kind of in that 25 to 40% clipped range. And then we have the Paramarquette, which really is a standout in terms of the, the low prevalence of clipped fish. And we have a few systems, the Kalamazoo, the St. Joe, the Clinton that have, you know, in that 50 to 80% range. And the Huron is, uh, you know, the most dominated by clipped fish at uh, over 90%. And I'll say too that, remember this, this percent clipped isn't quite the same as percent stocked yet, because we did have a handful of older stocked fish. So Huron, you know, some of those few fish that were uh, not clipped may have in fact, in fact been stocked before clipping. We, we don't have a way to age fish individually. But remember that as we go forward, it's, it's not quite the same thing. Next year, it, it pretty much will be. So if you look uh, at last year's results, percent clipped by watershed on the top here, uh, you have two years back, uh, it was our first season of data collection. And on the bottom, you have this past 2021 to 2022 season. Things tend to look pretty similar uh, for most river systems. One thing that did kind of jump out at me is that the prevalence of stocked fish dropped a bit in the Manistee and the Muskegon. So we're seeing kind of less of a, a um, contribution of those stocked or clipped fish. I would have thought that if anything, a lot of these rivers would have bumped up a little bit because you're having this aging of the clipped fish in the system, right? So you're the largest, oldest fish should uh, you know, be showing more percentage clipped because of the aging of those clipped fish in the system. But you also have this pulse of wild fish that we didn't have in the younger size classes, right? So here is where um, there's a difference in how we interpret this between the Manistee and the Muskegon. In the Manistee, we saw the percent clipped drop, but we also saw a big pulse of small wild fish. So now it kind of makes sense why you would see the manistee drop, even if things are going great uh, for the stock fish, uh, you would expect that because of that year class, you would see a bump up in the, the prevalence of the unclipped fish. Now the Muskegon is different because there was not a large uh, pulse of small wild fish that we picked up in the Muskegon. So it's a little more concerning when you see that drop. Uh, it may suggest that you're seeing a drop in the wild fish that are small in the system, but also with the uh, prevalence of the stocked fish. So that could be a little bit more concerning than, than the trends we see on the Manistee. So uh, here we look location by location. And here I wanna call out again, uh, what these bars are. We see these confidence intervals. We are 95% sure that the actual percentage of clipped fish is somewhere in that range. And what you'll see here is a huge difference from one river to the next in terms of the width of that confidence interval. So we have some rivers, uh, some stretches in, in particular rivers like the Upper Grand. I think we had six fish total in the Upper Grand last year. That's why you see this this confidence interval go from less than 10 to over 70%. So we really don't have any confidence that we can say anything about the upper grand. And uh, it's a good contrast though, between places like that and the PM river where we have a really high sample and really tight confidence interval that lets us say with, with a lot more certainty that what we're seeing really represents conditions in the river. Pretty cool here that the, the PM river uh, you see a difference, even though there aren't many fish in the lower river that were stocked, 
you can pick out that difference between the upper and lower river because we had high enough uh, sample size. So that, that was great to see. A few other trends to, to note here, looking at the manistee system, we were able to subdivide that most since we had so many uh, anglers catching fish uh, throughout the river system. The upper river jumps out, right, as much higher percentage clipped fish versus the middle and lower Manistee River. Uh, Bear Creek, we only had 13 fish caught, but all of them were unclipped. So <laughs> kind of a wide confidence interval, but it uh, goes all the way down to zero. The Little Manistee too, uh, not a huge number of fish, but uh, by and large, uh, wild fish coming from the Little Manistee, as we'd expect, since that does not get stocked. And that's the source for brood stock of mostly naturalized fish there. The Muskegon system, we had lower um, lower numbers of returns this year. So we can't really differentiate between percent wild in the upper versus lower river, but uh, it's kind of kind of intermediate between a lot of the other systems. Uh, in the Grand, we did see a really good difference between the lower Grand, where we did get more response this year, which was great, versus Prairie Creek, which is by and large wild. So you see the Grand River uh, proper in the lower river below 6th Street, is dominated by clipped fish and the Prairie Creek is, is mostly wild. Uh, the Kalamazoo, uh, the, I put the rabbit up there even though we only had I think three fish reported because uh, I'd really like to see some more reported from the rabbit and see if that is the source of uh, natural reproduction on the Kalamazoo. Uh, the St. Joe versus Dwajak, right? It sure looks like the Dwajak is lower but uh, with some more uh, effort there and some more fish coming in, we should be able to, to differentiate a little bit more closely between the St. Joe and Dwajak. So switching gears a little bit, uh, I mentioned before that we had this self-reported expertise category this year. So we had people who identified as intermediate skilled anglers, advanced or professional. And we looked at the relationship between that and the uh, the tendency to catch and release fish. I mentioned earlier on the survey, this is that graph that we saw earlier. But then I also asked uh, you know, if we could um, actually pick that up in the data from anglers, and we sure could, right? Intermediate anglers, uh, looking at catch data from inter intermediate anglers, they released 56% of the fish. That jumped up to 91% for advanced and 98% for professional anglers. So they're by and large catch and release only and they practice what they preach, right? So we're seeing that in the actual data that comes in. Uh, another thing to note here though, right? We had a pretty good number of intermediate anglers reporting, but their total number of fish caught was so much lower. Intermediate anglers, uh, and not to disparage anyone, I put myself in that category too, uh, overall reported 62 fish versus over a thousand from professional anglers. So keep in mind that uh, intermediate anglers are probably fishing less often and catching fewer fish than the pros as well. So um, the actual number of fish that were kept by intermediate anglers, it was 27 uh, versus 71 for advanced anglers, even though you know their release rate was much higher. So then we had a few more questions about what makes someone decide to harvest a fish, right? Our people are selectively harvesting. I, I like that term. It was, I think it was coined by the in fishermen uh, back in the 90s. They started talking more about selective harvest than just catch and release because we acknowledge you know, that, that a lot of populations of fish can really sustain good uh, responsible harvest of fish, but um, you know, we, we can certainly go too far with that as well. So what are the personal choices that people are making uh, when they decide whether or not to keep a fish. So we looked at our data uh, based on length. And what we saw is that the mid-sized fish tend to be harvested more. So fish in this 20 to 24 inch range were harvested 15% of the time, whereas only 5% of 15 to 19 inch fish and only 6% of 29 inch plus fish were harvested. So that kind of makes sense intuitively. You know, I think we people tend to want to release the little ones so they can go back and grow and they want to release the big ones because they're the big uh, you know, super spawners. So it's it's not surprising to see that people are selecting for those mid-sized fish. I might have also expected to see more selective harvest of females and some people might be keeping fish for the row to use as spawn, but that didn't really uh, come out. In the 2020, 2021 data, they looked about the same, male versus female. And it was really, it was still pretty similar in the past season, 21 to 22. 
Um, the arrow bars did have a little bit of overlap and they were pretty tight. So we were looking at about 90% release rate though for both the females and the males. And again, keep in mind who our audience is, right? This is a lot of people who capture and release most of everything. So if we look specifically maybe at beginners or intermediate folks who were, were maybe harvesting a few more fish for spawn and catching fewer, you might've seen uh, that jump out more, but we don't see that in our data. But uh, what we do see here is a difference between the clipped and unclipped fish harvest. So our unclipped fish in 2020 to 2021 uh, they were a little bit more likely to be released than the clipped fish. And we saw this um, even more pronounced in last year's data. And it looks like my computer just froze up for a second. But here is the data from last year. Again, we have over 2,000 unclipped fish included here, a really tight error bar for that. And it's quite a bit different. It's well over 90% for release rate on unclipped fish. And it's down around 80% for the re release rate on clipped fish. So people are selectively harvesting of the clipped versus unclipped fish, it looks like. And this goes along with one of our survey questions uh, about uh, you know, this uh, feeling that releasing the wild fish uh, may re relate to increased fitness down the road since those fish have already proven their, their ability, their, their, their line, their lineage has been naturally reproducing in Michigan waters in the very streams they're running in. So it does make some intuitive sense. So um, kind of wrapping up the, the slide portion uh, where it's just me talking and uh, we'll get to the, the team reports in a minute, but I wanted to make a few conclusions based on this uh, relative to the one fish limit. Most of our participants in this program were in favor of the one fish limit, uh, but I do want to make the caveat that we were really dealing with a lot of really advanced and pro anglers who tend to practice catch and release and support even more restrictive limits. Our program doesn't really represent the beginning anglers at all. And we have some uh, intermediate anglers in the program, but it's probably not really representative of, of how many beginning and intermediate anglers are really out there in the population of Michigan anglers at large enjoying the fishery. So we don't wanna minimize anything with them. What we really would like is more beginning and intermediate anglers to be uh, giving us data and, and filling out the survey and participating in this. So. Um, hopefully you can help spread the word and, and get folks who maybe only fish a few times a year in, in there as well. So uh, although the, some anglers did perceive benefit, uh, we didn't really see harvest uh, drop March 15th to May 15th. And I, I didn't have the slides in there for that, but I did look at uh, harvest rates during that time period. And we actually saw you know, some higher harvest rates within that time period versus before earlier in the year. So uh, it remains to be seen, you know, we will certainly do more looking at that, but we didn't see a lot of F, uh, evidence that harvest rate did drop, again, among our anglers who were mostly catch and release focused anyway. So that's a big caveat. Some other conclusions, uh, this is a big one. Selective harvest of mid-sized and clipped fish could really influence uh, data that are coming in from other uh, programs in the future from Creel Census and, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Biotechs that can only sample fish that have been harvested, right? So we know that people are selectively harvesting those mid-sized fish and also they tend to keep the clipped fish. So we may uh, see some bias and other data uh, related to that. Uh, also, we have the 15 to 19 inch skippers. Uh, we're nearly all wild this year due to the lack of stocking in 2021. And uh, some rivers, the St. Jude, Joe, Kalamazoo, and Muskegon in particular, didn't really show a lot of those 15 to 19 inch wild fish, which again, may be a little concerning for the future, or there may be other factors at play where those fish just don't run as skippers as much in those systems. It's hard to say, but we'll keep an eye on it. It's definitely something to be concerned about for next year. Uh, we did see a higher prevalence of stocked fish in spring versus the fall season. And I'm gonna go into more detail with this when we get uh, to the river teams because it was different from one river to the next, but overall you'll see the trend where a lot of rivers had higher prevalence of stocked fish in the spring. And when you look across all Lake Michigan tributaries, 33% uh, of fish in spring season were uh, clipped and only 17% in fall. So I wanna remind people, and I think this is already up in the chat box uh, from earlier, that 
We have uh, this great resource page where we have a lot of what has come out of this project, uh, recordings from past presentations. This one will be up there hopefully by the next week. We also already have uh, the slides themselves. If you want to go back and take a look at some of the slides that I just shared, they're already up online uh, and they're on this resource page. If you scroll down and look at the, the bottom left uh, column. So now we can move to questions and it looks like we have one in the Q&A from Adam. Lake Michigan Basin return, could that bump of skippers be related to COVID year natural reproduction? And yeah, that's exactly what I, I think it is. It's that uh, pulse of fish that uh, would have been um, coming into the system in 2021. So it's a little confusing when you think about steelhead though, because the fish that migrated out in 2021 as smolts, if they're wild fish, they might have been one year old, but they might have been two years old as well. They may have spent two years in the river system, possibly even three. So it's not quite the same as saying the 2021 year class, uh, but they're the smolts that came into the lake in 2021. That is what that pulse of wild fish is. Um, I guess a related note uh, might be why was that so high or was it so high? We don't really know. We don't have a whole lot of uh, historical data where we can say that this, this was an unusually good or bad year class. All we know is that we see that it was there last year. So now uh, we have a couple things in the chat and Caitlin, if you can open up the chat box now, we're gonna get to the team reports and go around uh, the state here. And we're gonna open up the chat so that if you have a comment or question from here on out, um, it'll be kind of a conversational session. And hopefully we can, we can get to some of the questions that come up in the chat on the fly. And we may have other people type answers. If you have questions from someone on a specific river system, uh, it can all be here in the chat from here out. We'll see how this works and we'll get to the river teams, and most of you have probably been on these before. So again, we have a, an agency partner from each. Uh, not everyone can make it to every one of our, our meetings, but we'll go around and we'll see uh, who's here to, to report. And just had the screen freeze up again. Here's the list of all of our river teams around the state and our partners. Uh, we start off on the Betsy and work our way south along Lake Michigan before switching to the other basins. So we'll kick it off with the Betsy River. And I'm gonna have to see if I can see who all is on the call too while I'm doing this. But uh, again, there's gonna be a lot of numbers on the screen. I figured we'll just uh, take the reports while I leave the stats up for the Betsy River. Uh, we had good participation, over 300 fish there, uh, around 30% clipped. It did jump up in the spring like many of the rivers did. Uh, average length of 26 inches. We had 10 people reporting. And I will say, uh, as we go through these, that um, I wouldn't put a lot of faith right now in, in what the catch rates mean. We may touch on that a little bit more on the next call in December. But, uh, you know, obviously we have a lot of people who fish different ways and uh, they're all lumped together for this. So we had a catch rate of 0.33 fish per hour, that's steelhead per hour, steelhead over 15 inches. And that works out to about three hours expected of fishing to catch a steelhead. And uh, again, that's overall just everything lumped together. So we can do more analysis to, to see more what that means and how it compares with other systems. But I just wanted to put it up there for general interest now. And I also, uh, these are done by week. So if you see the clipped and unclipped catch by week, this goes from week one, which would be the first week of January, through the spring season all the way to the end of May. And I have the, the green in here to show that March 15th to May 15th timeframe that does correlate to the, the one fish limit on some of the rivers. But it also gives you a nice way to compare as we go through them and say, where is the, the peak that we're seeing? And in the Betsy River, we saw that the peak of that uh, wild fish run actually came in a little earlier than that March 15th. Uh, time frame, whereas the peak of the stockfish, it, it was kind of drawn out, but that was a bit later in the year uh, than the uh, peak of the, the wildfish here. 
So uh, if we have, I don't think Heather was able to make the call today. Um, so we don't have Heather from DNR. And I don't think Fritz is on the call either. Fritz Heller, are you here? I don't think so. So I, I see one number that doesn't have a name next to it, but I don't think that's Fritz. So uh, we'll go on. Unless anyone has questions or comments specific to the Betsy, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Mark Tonello is here. I hope he is. But I would love to hear his view on pine natural reproduction now that the big manistee is broke into three segments. Uh, this is Pine Creek uh, had, had up to 50% clip, much lower downstream from pine and even lower down from bear. Yep, that that uh, definitely matches what we saw, uh, but I don't think Mark was able to make it today, unfortunately, uh, so we don't have uh, his take on that today. And Manistee, here's the, the results right here from the Manistee. And again, we had a great return over a thousand fish in the Manistee proper. Again, what I showed before included um, some from Bear Creek and also some from the Little Manistee River. This is just the Manistee proper. Um, we saw a big increase from fall to spring too. This is probably the biggest one from 12% clipped in the fall run up to 42% in spring. Uh, pretty impressive uh, difference there. And that does correspond to what you noted there with um, more fish upstream uh, being clipped. Then we got the upper river from Tippy to Pine Creek. Uh, you see a lot of clip fish showing up there, 53%. And then I think my computer is doing an update or something. This is great because every time I'm hitting this, there's a huge delay. So bear with me. Uh, but as I go to the next uh, stretch of river, the middle river, we will have uh, a little different look with more clipped fish or more unclipped fish showing up and more fish showing up earlier in the year. And it's going really slow. I think we do have uh, John Ray on the call. So John, do you wanna chime in with uh, any observations on the, the manistee? Um, hearing people get into uh, Scomania much this summer and any fish showing up yet? Yeah. Dan, just kind of, you know, I don't know kind of what to say here, so I'm happy to do this as a Q&A if anybody hears anything. But a lot of the stuff that you're reporting, and again, my name's John Ray, about 20-some years of guiding on the Big River, I've always seen a really big push of skippers. So that was the data that you showed didn't surprise me at all. Um, it was a characteristic of the river from fishing other rivers that I always thought was interesting hmm. that skippers did always run the big man. Um, I always thought that fall was a, a wild scenario and spring was more of a clipped scenario for my years of guiding and just something I always saw. So it, again, the data doesn't really surprise me on that side feels like the wild fish come in so they can run the tributaries um, and the spring fish come in later because they're going to the dam from where they were put. So, you know, just kind of looking at this, but um, Skamania fishing, kind of the big thing um, on the data that I saw, if I had to go with that one, it doesn't feel, if I had to stereotype Skamania, it's definitely a fish that people like to keep. So there's data missing from the big man, from even the professional guides that keep fish. Um, they're not filling out the survey, which is something, you know, and I know some of them. So just ask them why they're not, I guess. But there's data missing here where it feels like a lot of the stuff is catch and release, which is more my party and the people that I help spur to fill out a lot of this data. So. It is skewed a little bit. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's all really good to know. Um, it's interesting that for whatever reason, the big manistee, you know, those natural fish may be inclined to, to run as skippers 
more than in other areas. It may be some natural selection that's gone on over many generations, uh, hard to say, but interesting that we're picking that up in the data too. And, um, you know, the, the trends of seeing more stocked fish come in later and go straight up to the dam, we definitely see that. Um, hopefully we can get more people participating who are doing more Skamania fishing and more catch and keep fishing. Cause again, we know uh, that, uh, that is going on and, uh, we can only, we can only make conclusions about what we see, but, uh, it is really important to remember that we're not seeing everything and that anything you do is going to have some kind of bias, no matter how hard you try, but mm -hmm. we, we try to kind of address that. And I think, uh, now that the graphs are finally popping up here, um, We can superimpose this uh, time frame of March 15th to May 15th. And something that comes out when you see this and you look from the upper to the lower river is that the upper river fishery is, is really covered by that March 15th to May 15th time frame. And when you get to the, the middle man manistee, it's, it's right on the early cusp, but then the peak in the lower river was much earlier in the year, right? It's uh, kind of late February, early March and it really tapers off by March 15th in the lower river. So I thought that was kind of interesting to see how that jumped out too. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, again, understanding how the river fishes, it doesn't surprise me that a lot of the data, you know, the first run, like that first top up by Tippy, the salmon really spawn and fish really do charge. So that's why that blurp is there. The middle part is the hardest section to fish early. And then again, the lower section, because the fish are coming in and, you know, if we had to talk about steelhead and the behavior and how aggressive they are, they are easier to catch as soon as they come in. So people definitely tend to fish in that lower end early in the year, just like they would, you know, in the top part right behind the salmon. Yeah, sure. And, and, you know, I think as we interpret these two, uh, people are also going to go wherever the fishing's best or easiest. So yep. although you see a tail off in the lower river, that doesn't mean there's no fish there. It may also mean that people have switched from fishing the lower to upper river just because it's better. So yeah. and as we interpret it, that's just part of the interpretation. And incidentally, if we combined all reaches of the Manistee, you see here how, how nice it was to separate that out to upper, upper middle, and lower. Because when you look at the whole river, it, it really looks like kind of a, a mess because you have all these different curves superimposed. So it was great that we had the, the great response we did on the Manistee and we could really get to that fine grained uh, you know, analysis by reach. So we'll switch over to the Paramarquette River where we, again, we had really good uh, response over 570 steelhead caught with much less uh, prevalence of clip fish. Not surprising, you know, it's such a great large undammed river system with a lot of natural reproduction. Um, we did see uh, no, no real difference. I mean, 8% in fall versus 7% in spring. It's, it's pretty low in both. Uh, saw a fair number of large fish, fish, 29 inches and above. We had 17 people reporting uh, complete data. And uh, we did pick out this difference between the lower and upper river uh, in terms of percent clipped, jumped from 5% in the upper river to 9% below, which makes a lot of sense because sure, you're always going to get some strays, even in areas that aren't stocked at all, but the big south branch of the PM is stocked. So fish entering the lower river uh, may be stocked fish that are really headed to the big south. So it's, it's surprising. It's not surprising. And it's good to see that we, that jumped out in the data. And again, if you look at the, the different timing of the runs, really interesting to see that that lower river peaked before the March 15th cutoff and then really transitioned uh, to more fishing in the upper river. And also kind of interesting to see on the PM in the upper river in particular that there's, there's fish kind of throughout the spring season uh, showing up. So some of the curves that we see for other rivers, uh, there are big spells where nothing's being caught. And right from the second week of the year in Feb in January, all the way through uh, late March, you're seeing fish in the upper PM. So PM, I think we have uh, Jim Boss on the call. Yeah, I'm here. So any observations from uh, early this season or just uh, reactions to- uh, uh, Nothing from this season yet. Um... But uh, the one thing I, I did notice uh, 
even though the numbers of uh, clip fish are very low, very low, there did seem to be an increase uh, in the ones I saw late in the season, uh, mid to late April. Um, it seemed to be more clip fish late, and the wild fish must uh, were earlier than that. I guess I, I think we talked about that earlier, but uh, that was one observation. One question I've got, I joined the meeting about 10 minutes late, so I don't know if you already covered it before I got on, but um, your graphs go from week one to 22, looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said that starts in January. Do we have data collected in the fall, October, November, December? Yep, we do. And when I put out uh, a longer uh, kind of white paper with all the fact sheets and all the rivers. We'll have more of that. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't include it here. It was just a lot. All right. Look at. All right then. <laughs> I saw the differences between the, the fall and the spring and I'm thinking, well, where is the fall data? Because all I'm seeing is January on. So, all right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is dialing in on the graph to just that January through end of all right. period. But uh, I do have the, the percent clipped, just fall versus spring. And, and what we saw in a lot of rivers, the, the, the fall season was you know, a lot of lower bars as well. So. No, that's, that's all I've got. All right, any more questions, comments on the, the PM? Let's see if anything. I still I would like to get somebody that, somebody that would fish the Big South proper um, and give us some data from the Big South. I mean, Mark Tonello volunteered a year ago, but we haven't figured out how to fund him yet. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I thought of that myself too. I, I, <laughs> if I get a chance, I want to take a trip to the Big South. And then, <laughs> but uh, so far, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have somebody that's doing it every week there. You know, and uh, it really would. Yeah, get, um, get some significant data from what it really is in that that particular river. Yes. Yeah. Cause we know it's a good mix of, we, it has its own wild fish as well. There was a big habitat project there years back and um, it's an interesting system. And it's, it's if, all... if we could determine if majority of the fish returning to the big South are wild, then we can say, well, why are we planting them there? So that's true too. Yeah. And it, you know, having them there is great now because we can really get some good numbers because we, we do have at least that signal from the stock fish to, use in there too so again if anyone knows anyone who fishes the big south all the time please spread the word and, and ask them to absolutely it, it only takes on some of these little trips you know two or three people who are good anglers out there regularly we can get a lot of data from that so we'll move on to the muskegon um we got a little lower than i expected you know muskegon's a huge fishery and uh, we have enough to, to make some conclusions here, but it would really be nice to see more. Um, and it just went back. Sorry about the, uh, the Zoom issues here. I just skipped back. Uh, so we have a lower prevalence of clipped fish, as I mentioned before, um, with actually a, a decrease from fall to spring, which is unusual. Uh, most of the other rivers showed the exact opposite. Um, we had eight anglers reporting data and actually one of the higher catch rates, again, I don't want to make too much about of the, the catch rates, but it was interesting to see that people were catching fish pretty regularly, you know, uh, only two hours, 1.9 hours to catch a steelhead is, is pretty darn good. Um, if we look at the upper river, we had, um, you know, a, a jump up from fall to spring in the upper river in, in terms of the prevalence of clipped fish. So maybe that's maybe that's not so surprising. Here we have the fish running up to the uh, Croton Dam area. And maybe like the Tippy Dam scenario, you have more of those stockers showing up in the spring. Whereas the lower river, you had uh, more clipped fish in the fall, which is a little counterintuitive. But again, uh, not huge uh, numbers of fish here, but pretty good. 85 fish coming from the lower river and, and 38 from the upper. So uh, I don't think we have Mark Canelo or our uh, team leader. Hey, Dan, I just, um, Mark's yeah, not on, but uh, I just want to mention that um, why we're on the Muskegon and we also passed the Manistee that the, we have a krill program that started in October there. So the month of October, it's a little limited right now. Um, 
we only have one clerk per river, but starting hopefully in November, once we get more clerks hired, we'll have two clerks per river and they'll run all the way through um, the end of May. So it'll be a nice contrast of throughout the season and it'd be neat to compare more of your average anglers to what we have here in this program of more advanced and pro anglers. So it'll be re yeah. really cool. We got Good. this in Fantastic. I'm really glad to hear that. And it will be a, a great compliment to all that we know about steelhead. Uh, another thing I'll always reiterate when we talk about the difference between what we do here and the Creel program, not only would we get more from beginning and intermediate anglers that, that fill out more of the angling public, but uh, you really need the Creel program to get at overall catch and overall effort. So that's why as I was going through already, I'm saying don't put too much faith in our, our effort and catch and catch rate figures. Um, I did put them up here, but what we get from the Creel census program is going to be way better for those particular uh, metrics. So keep that in mind. Yeah, these, these catch rates I'm seeing from these anglers that are participating in your program are phenomenal. They are. <laughs> so Again, they know, as, a, they as really an intermediate angler, I, I'm looking at them going, oh boy, <laughs> takes me a lot longer to catch a steelhead. <laughs> So on the grand, um, we had a lot of different tributaries represented, but not a whole lot of fish from each of them. So uh, we had a couple fish from the Rogue, a couple from Plaster Creek, a couple from uh, Fish Creek, uh, maybe one or two even from the Red Cedar, but uh, we didn't have a whole lot from any areas except the Lower Grand and Prairie Creek. So we couldn't make uh, big conclusions, but it was nice to see people fishing in a lot of these little tributaries. We had 179 fish overall. And uh, again, the, the percent clipped, you really got to look at the difference here between Prairie Creek and the Lower Grand. Uh, very low prevalence of clipped fish in Prairie Creek, which uh, actually jumped a little bit in spring, but that's probably not significant. Whereas the lower grand uh, really jumped from 55% clipped in fall to 87% in spring, uh, just a huge difference. So uh, Brian Gunderman, uh, do you have any, any additional insight on the grand from the DNR perspective? Yes, I'll just say that our, our fish ladders reopened uh, around the 1st of September. Um, so far, we've been seeing quite a few coho going through. Um, not a ton of steelhead yet, but we expect that to pick up as temperatures cool off a little bit. Uh, a couple other updates for the grand. Um, the phase one of the Grand Rapids Whitewater Project involving the removal of the four coffer dams um, is, uh, this came out for public comment. There was a public hearing, uh, I believe the public comment period ends October 10th. So um, that's uh, a big development uh, in the lower Grand. On the upper Grand, um, the city of Lansing um, is, uh, we were just selected to get funding um, from the through the Corps of Engineers for a feasibility study for removal or modification of North Lansing Dam. Um, so there's probably be a press release coming out about that soon. Um, so what it means now is just there's going to be a study done. It doesn't mean the dam is going to be removed, but it means they are going to be looking at all their different options for that dam. Um, and for those of you who don't know, that's our uppermost fish ladder. The uh, um, city of Lansing maintains the Brinke uh, fish ladder at that spot. Um, so that's kind of the last place that steelhead can get through. Um, and having that dam out would make it a little bit easier for them to get farther up into, say, the Red Cedar River and some of those tributaries. Um, but that's about all I got for the Grand. Thanks. So 
moving to the Kalamazoo, uh, we got, uh, again, a pretty good turnout, over 100 fish. I mentioned earlier the, the rabbit only had a handful, so uh, not really broken into upper and lower stretches on the Kalamazoo. Uh, we do see kind of an earlier peak right in the, the middle of March versus some of the other rivers and a lot of, a lot of clip fish showing up there. Um, so Jay, do you have any additional uh, things to add on the Kalamazoo? Um, no, I'm just, I'm going to hope to get some more people involved. Um, cause there are a lot of people that fish the Kalamazoo for steelhead. I will mention the summer runs were pretty good. Um, mm. and the Kalamazoo up the Swan Creek, there are a few fall fish around now, but not a whole lot. The salmon really just started moving up there. Um, it's kind of been relatively warm and the water's been low, but expect, uh, I'm hoping the fall fish show up. Um, one thing I will mention is that we had a microchemistry, uh, project done on the Lake Michigan proper and a lot of the angler caught fish out in Lake Michigan, the wild fish came from the Kalamazoo river area. So it'd be neat to see how this plays out for the next few years to see if the majority of the fish are actually stocked fish there or if it starts to show more wild fish. We were a little surprised by that microchemistry study that it showed the Kalamazoo as a good wild producer, but you know maybe there's just something wrong with that study. So having well, more data here would be, would be awesome. And you have any other uh, thoughts on where those wild fish might be coming from, if it's mostly Swan Creek or Rabbit River, or if there's others? Swan, Rabbit, um, Bear um, would be the main ones. All right, thanks. Um, move down to the St. Joe watershed. And here we have a nice comparison uh, between the Dwajak and St. Joe. Again, not huge numbers of fish, but enough that we can probably say something about it. Uh, it was really um, a difference, uh, you know, from, from fall to spring, uh, Dwajak jumped up in, in terms of the percent clipped, which, um was interesting um the Wajak does get planted the saint joe also gets heavily planted in uh indiana waters upstream from where most of the fishing occurs in michigan and this is was kind of an anomaly because we saw more clipped fish coming in uh in fall versus spring for the saint joe uh michigan waters my my sense is that might be because you have so many fish that are headed upstream uh into indiana but not not 100% sure, just speculation there. Was interesting that we had such a high prevalence of large fish, 46% were 29 inches and above, which just kind of blew out of the water all the other systems. So a lot of big fish. Of course, that's that's nice uh, for anglers. Hopefully it just doesn't mean that there are a lot of old fish and not too many smaller, younger fish coming up because uh, we didn't see really much of anything when we looked at that 15 to 19 inch pulse of fish in the St. Joe. Again, don't want to put too much stock in that, but it's not, not super encouraging to not see many of the smaller fish. So Jay Anglin, um, see a Jay on the phone, but we got uh, Jay Anglin. I, I thought he was on the list to, to be here today, but I don't see, don't see him. So unless you're here and I'm not seeing you, We'll probably move on. I know Jay's been involved a lot in the meanders project or re-meandering re stretches of the uh, Dwajak River. Uh, it's a really interesting system. Dan came out there. So um, Brian, do you have any other uh, observations from uh, the Dwajak or St. Joe? Brian Gunderman? Yeah, so uh, first thing, the Dwajak isn't stocked. Um, we stock in Michigan, I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of 65 or 70,000 in Michigan waters of the St. Joe, and then Indiana stocks a, a bunch of Skamania up in their part. Um, so the, the main river gets stocked pretty heavy, but the Dwajak doesn't get stocked at all. So hmm. those clipped, clipped fish are straying from somewhere else. Um, on the, while we're on the subject of the Dwajak, um, some big things are happening there. Obviously, we had the dam removal um, a year or so ago that completed was completed uh the pucker street dam um we've had a lot of steelhead movement above there since that point um 
we just did a survey on Pokagon Creek, which is one of the tributaries upstream of that dam. And we caught 12 juvenile steelhead during that survey. So we are documenting some natural reproduction in the, in that trip. Um, and I know Jay was, uh, Matt, Diana, and I did a float with Jay England this summer, and he was describing all the different places where they're seeing tons of steelhead reds upstream of the dam. So uh, he's pretty excited about um, the results there. Um, other things on the St. Joe, um, we have our, a fish cam, a live fish cam of the Brain Springs Ladder that's hosted by PaddleAndPole.com. That camera has been down since early August. Um, we think we need a, a new webcam in there, but the um, – the guy from Paddle and Pole, we have not been able to make contact with, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But as soon as we can get him out there, we want to get that replaced because I know that's real popular with anglers. Um, the only other thing I'd say is as, as far as this run is going, um, yeah, we're seeing some steelhead going through. Um, I just checked Indiana's website. They're seeing them as far up as South Bend right now. So um, we are getting starting to get some steelhead movement, although the water temperature is still in the 60s. So it'll probably start ramping up when we get down closer to the mid to lower fifties. Um, but that's, that's all I have for the St. Joe right now. Well, thanks, Brian. I'll, I'll ask a, a follow-up too on the Dwajak. Does it surprise you that there are so many clip fish straying up there? Or is that uh, kind of been normal even when the dam was there, were they piling up there before? Uh, it doesn't surprise me. I figure there was a lot of strays there. Um, prior to the dam coming out there wasn't a ton of spawning habitat there there was spawning habitat in the main river but it's pretty it goes really fast so we, we had concerns that the you know eggs would kind of get washed out of the gravel um but I, i'm guessing there's still some natural reproduction in the main main river plus some of the tributaries um the other thing i forgot to point out for the duwajik is the pokagon band of uh, potawatomi recently completed um some meander restoration on their property they reconnected two meanders um in phase one of their project and they are now uh positioned to start phase two and reconnect some more more meanders um and those are if you're familiar with the duaj act that's between uh dodd park and peavine street so um and the other thing I'll do is just a uh, shout out to Jay Anglin and, and uh, the other guides and avid anglers on the Dwajak because they've been doing a ton of work to keep the stretch between Dodd Park and Kinsey Road navigable. That is a, there's just log jams everywhere. And they've done a lot of work to selectively clear out just enough that you can get through there. It's still challenging. It's definitely challenging, but um, if you know what you're doing, you can get through there now. Great. Glad to hear it. It's, uh, that's it for the Lake Michigan Basin streams. So uh, we'll circle around to Superior, Huron, and uh, then our St. Clair Erie tributaries here. And these will be a little different, right? Because we had uh, you know, relatively few fish in each stream for the Superior Basin. So this is just grouped together. And you can see that it was really you know, a, a late April, early May fishery on Lake Superior. Uh, not surprising, right? That far north. So you're warming up a bit later and uh, all wild fish. So Corey Kovacs, I know I saw it looked like he was having audio problems a second ago. Are you on now? Yes, sir. I switched over to my computer. I was on the road with my mobile phone. So oh, great. can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, no, it was, you know, pretty refreshing to know that we had a few anglers actually <laughs> participating this past year. So much appreciated from those anglers that gave it a try. I know that some of them had some challenges with the app and trying to get them completed and, and, and whatnot. So um, I appreciate your assistance on that, Dan, and trying to get these guys set up and up and running. But, um, I, you know, we have four anglers reporting on this, it looks like. I know I had requested a couple of other um, anglers to start reporting as well. So hopefully for 2023, we can get them on for full time. And it sounded like you said there were a few more interested here at the 11th hour. So hopefully mm -hmm. we can get some more participation. But in general, um, I guess I'm not surprised um, considering the streams that were reported um, from your earlier figures, um, the Sucker River, the Rock River, neither one is stocked. So I would anticipate unclipped fish being reported. 
And, you know, we, we stock a, a variety of streams, but none of those look like they were reported um, within the data early on. So anyhow, we have a lot of naturally reproducing steelhead here in Lake Spear. Again, we just sprinkle a few steelhead here and there. But, um, you know, our, our run this spring in general, I thought was fairly good, um, albeit a relatively short time frame, but it was very good for, for a little while there. And then it, it just kind of warmed up quickly and, and the fish moved off. But anyhow, this fall, um, you know, the salmon run with the water being so low and as warm as we were, as late as we were, now we're starting to likely overlap with some of the steelhead moving in early in the streams this fall. So those anglers uh, still chasing cohos and pinks are probably going to start running into some steelhead here in the middle of October to the end of October. But I guess I'll be really interested to see what the data says for next year, uh, especially since we are missing that 2021 cohort. I'll be really curious to see uh, what the data looks like then. But yeah, this was really good, Dan. I appreciate it. Thanks. And, and I'll mention, you know, I, I there were some people who actually submitted a lot of data. And I remember a couple on the chocolate that didn't follow through with the survey. So the data were in there, but I couldn't use it. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're keep uh, when you're talking to angler groups, um, you know, if they take the time to, to fill out the data, uh, we, we just need that survey to be able to use it uh, because of our protocols at MSU. So uh, hopefully we'll have a little better uh, follow through on that last year. But again, it was great to see at least we're, we're getting some folks to participate from Superior. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll add one more thing. I did speak to Roger Dryl um, earlier today, uh, and he is he has recently retired from the ARL at uh, Lake Superior State University from our, our partner there raising the Atlantic salmon for many years. So he is now retired. Uh, he has moved on to the west end of the Upper Peninsula and Kind of, you know, his home stomping waters, he's from the west end of the UP, so uh, he, he got back over there and taking care of some family and doing whatnot. But I did ask him, I said, you know, are you still interested in participating in the role um, as far as support for this? And he thought that maybe it would be better for, for him, to, for us to move on and try to select someone else. So I am in the process of thinking about other anglers and other folks who could very well help with our partnership. And trying to advertise and promote this program because I can tell you with some of the changes that we're proposing for stocking um, in different locations, this is going to be critical for evaluating those changes in stocking. So if we can have an advocate out there on the ground with the anglers, that's going to be really critical for getting more participation. It's only going to help further with evaluation, but um, I, I am sorry to see Roger go from it, but at the same time, I totally understand and uh, he's moved on to some uh, more uh, productive waters, it sounds like. Great. Well, keep me uh, in a loop. If you connect with someone who seems like a great fit, uh, we will certainly have someone uh, step into that role for Superior and, and uh, look to, to spread and promote in different ways. So thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. So switching over to Huron. Um, Again, this is kind of a hodgepodge with the, the rifle being the most uh, abundant trib, but we didn't have a whole lot from the other ones. So I see uh, Randy's here and uh, I know you got a lot of uh, coat of wire tag heads collected last year, although not quite as many as you wanted, right? Yeah, it was a uh, very, very tough year to say the least. Uh, spring 2022, um, you know, look at your graphs, why you don't have a lot of participants, um, partic you know, helping you out here with, with data. It still is a reflection of kind of where we're at right now. Um, fishing, uh, sea life fishing was very poor uh, in all the tributaries. Um, 2020, uh, during that COVID event, uh, it really hurt our stocking. Um, most of the fish were brought early, and when they come early, they um, enter the thresholds of, of predation um, with walleye, lake trout, and cormorants. And then on top of that, we had the floods, and some of the, uh, some of the um, restrictions for travel for the uh, stocking trucks resulted in uh, about 40% of the Asabo River stocks, uh, steelhead stocks being um, put 
in at the Sheboygan River due to distance uh, restrictions for Thompson State Fish Hatchery. We had hoped that that would uh, kind of you know, show a, a better um, return there for Sheboygan, um, but uh, that just didn't happen um, over you know this spring. Um, they didn't really see an uptick in, in the catch rate due to that um, increase in stocking there. And of course it impacted uh, the Asabo as well. And then you go into 2021 where we don't stock at all and you have two years of impairment and the streams that really had the best fishing um, were the ones that had that natural com uh, recruitment component um, like the rifle, uh, the East Branch, um, even uh, Asabo had some from that Van Etten arm that dumps into the Asabo. The upper stretches of that Van Etten system can have some natural recruitment and contribute. And then further up into the Black and some of those other smaller streams going up and through at the upper end, those were better fishing than a lot of the larger tributaries. Uh, Thunder Bay was absolutely a, a botch as well. And um, you can kind of see how important that hatchery component is to the Lake Huron um, tributaries. I, as I look at your data, I see um, a, a very good complement uh, for the Lake Michigan tributaries with natural recruitment. And you put those two together in, in decent strengths and you could have a great fishery in these river systems. But we're more dependent here on this, on, in the Lake Huron side to this hatchery component. There is some recruitment there, but um, that hatchery component is, is really important. And we're working towards improving those stock uh, survival Lake managers have made adjustments to stocking locations, timing, and uh, we won't realize those results for another year or two. But we're looking for bigger and better things. And when we do have, hopefully, <laughs> when we see some of these, hopefully these improvements will show improvement in the steelhead fishery to our tributaries. And when that happens, hopefully we can um, help illustrate further in your data with more people participating to help you illustrate, you know, the, the improvement. Yeah, I, I did not realize um, how much of an impact there was in 2020 because of the the travel restrictions. Um, so that that's a really good thing to to note uh, as I write more of this up and why we might be seeing what we're seeing. And yeah, it actually, you know, it it kind of. Um, some sites didn't get stocked. Um, some were condensed to other sites. It really did a lot of flip flopping around. So, yeah, it, it was it, it impacted the 2020 stocking, and then you know you follow that up with 2021, and here we have you know two year classes that are kind of uh, <laughs> below, well below average. <laughs> Obviously, 2021 being not stocked at all. So. Uh, we cringed. I cringed going into this spring. Um, I struggled to get my 200 fish data set on the Asabo and try to illustrate the clipped versus non-clipped, as you probably seen from what I what I sent you. 55% um, hatchery, 45% um, natural recruited. You know, even despite those low numbers. So that really gives you a feel for how important that hatchery component is to that river run fishery. It's, um, it's very, very important to it. So, and this is a challenge, um, you know, putting a silver fish fishery in the dimensions of a lake that's, uh, hot, you know, got a great lake trout fishery, a great walleye fishery, and those are two of the top predators to stocks and to throw in the Cormorant issue alongside of that. And you have yourself a challenge to create a uh, recreational silverfish fishery. But um, I think we're making progress and uh, everybody's working really hard on it. Um, lake managers are really focused. And uh, I think some of the changes that we are implementing here 
as of this spring are going to show some benefit within the next two years. Yeah, hopefully so. So appreciate the report and, and keep up the great work getting the, the data up there on the, the Huron side. So, Well, I think you did a great job with all your data there. And I, I really uh, appreciate you taking the time to put that all together. That's impressive. Yeah, and likewise. <laughs> so um, we'll move on to the last couple streams we have here, the Clinton and Huron and Southeast. And I think... Uh, our partners from the Huron and Clinton don't seem to be on the call. I knew uh, Eric wasn't going to be able to make it. Uh, someone has a hand raised, Caitlin. Do you see who that is? It might yep, be. They can talk now. Hey, Dan, it's Eric. Oh, great. So you did make it. I wasn't sure. So uh, how did how did you uh, fare in the Clinton? Uh, and then I guess I haven't uh, talked Just about a lot it. of high water. Um, it's just gets so high and fast and dirty it's hard to fish so we had a late start and it seemed like all the water from september and october really uh i think moved a lot of fish that we didn't even see to be honest with you um it kind of stayed high until it got really cold and dropped out for a little bit before spring came in and gave us a bunch of high water again so uh, I feel like a lot of anglers really didn't represent, you know, what the catch was a year prior, uh, where we had some lower water and a lot of fish were caught, you know, they didn't go upstream so fast. Um, you know, we've had the bypass reopen last year. Um, so those fish were able to get above the dam. Um, so depending on where you fish last year, it seemed like a lot of fall. Uh, the trend around the state was the fall fish were more natural reproduction. And um, I fished a lot upstream and uh, I think I, I was around 45% of the natural reproduction and probably most of those came in fall time. So um, kind of struggled in springtime. It seemed like all that water pushed up a bunch of fish. And when it got really cold, no fish came in, but there was already a pile um and they spawned as soon as they could and they were gone and then it was like it was a, a small window where there wasn't a lot of fish and then uh, spring fish moved in and it was mostly clip fish so i don't know um i really feel that if we uh changed our stocking location would help some of these stock fish overall just to increase our numbers if um they were possibly to put them upstream or it's a little bit more suited but um, I don't know, uh, that'd be more up to managers. Well, thanks. Um, I, I don't know. I, I thought Cleo was going to be on as well. Uh, maybe he is. I'll, I'll call out. Maybe he's got a hand raised somewhere. I'm not seeing. But if not, uh, I'll chime in too and say one thing I noted on the Clinton, uh, we had seven anglers reporting and uh, a lot of really complete data. Uh, so if you see the Clinton here, we had kind of a dry spell, as you mentioned, with the high water. Um, what was interesting to me is people who fished the Clinton were fishing out there, you know, whether or not the fishing was good, it seemed. <laughs> it seemed like folks were really dedicated and putting the time in right through the middle of the winter in the middle of the high water. And people were still logging trips, even though, you know, several trips in a row would be blank. So I feel really good about the, the way the graph looks on the Clinton, as far as the fact that people were fishing that whole time. And when you see fish, that's when the fish showed up. So that was cool to see. Uh, also interesting to, when you contrast it to the Huron where uh, there's very little or no uh, natural reproduction, you, you know, you do see more of those clipped fish, un unclipped fish coming out of the Clinton, and they kind of did show up uh, throughout the spring season and in fall. Um, uh, the catch rates, again, uh, you don't want to make too much of the catch rates. And I think part of why you see the lower rate in the Clinton is just because the folks who were out there fishing were just diehards who were there day in, day out, whether or not fish were biting. So cool to see. And I don't know if we have anyone else. We had a few unknowns and just phone numbers. Uh, if anyone else on our panelists wants to chime in, um, this would be a good time. Otherwise, I think we are through um, all the teams and I don't see any more new chats. So thanks a lot. This has been great. It was a wonderful year. Uh, 
great to have so much information from so many people and, and have so much to talk about. So there were things I did not get to that I'll probably get to uh, on the December call. Um, we'll schedule that probably for another uh, Wednesday since that came out as the best day for this one for our panelists. And uh, I see a couple of thank yous. Uh, again, thank you to everyone. It wouldn't, wouldn't work without all of you. So uh, with that, we'll adjourn uh, on time for once. We didn't run over. So uh, take care and good fishing this season. Bye.